Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this regular Digital video, we're going to be discussing and analyzing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting out with an update with a story we covered yesterday concerning Intel prohibiting you benchmarking the microcode updates for their various processors. So in the license agreement, it was uh, a small clause that said, well, you are prohibited essentially to run any benchmarks and comparison and posting those benchmarks online for others to look at. And naturally, this quickly started to upset users and Intel have since uh, changed their policy. However, the website techpowerupper.com does bring a rather interesting point up. And that is that the license here seems to be more targeted towards the open source community. But it doesn't specifically state whether companies such as AWS and let's say Microsoft would be able to publish those benchmarks themselves. So whether a company like Amazon or Microsoft would be free to disclose this information is still ambiguous. So hopefully we'll have an update to that soon. I would really like to know why uh, Intel decided to add this particular clause in, whether it was an overzealous employee or whether it was a policy the company had and they just thought, well, if we put this in, maybe we can get away with it. You never know. But obviously, in a climate like today with IT professionals speaking to themselves all of the time over the internet and, of course, in large companies as well, actually trying to hide this information just doesn't it doesn't serve you well at all. It's it's going to come out. People are going to start doing these benchmarks. They're going to start figuring out uh, internally anyway. And besides, it's it's almost an unenforceable clause. Like, what are they going to do? Are they going to go after every single person who's posting on every single forum discussing these benchmarks? It just it's just it's just not enforceable. And to be honest, it's absolutely ridiculous that Intel added this clause in. But I am glad that they have removed it. But I do want clarification for corporations whether they themselves are uh, available. I do want clarification to see whether corporations can post these benchmarks. We also have an update from AMD and the company are, quote, betting big on 7nm. As we know, the company are making shifts to 7nm, not just on their Zen micro architecture, which of course will debut with Zen 2 on 7nm, and also Vega 20, which will be shifting to 7nm. It has various changes, including a wider memory bus, plus some other stuff to do with the shaders and so on. I, and the reason I'm being so ambiguous there and saying other stuff is because no one really knows outside of AMD what types of changes they are making, but they have said that there's going to be the numerous changes, for example, improved clock speed, but there are other fundamental changes to the architecture as well, but they're just not ready to reveal that information just yet to the public. But in an exclusive interview with the website crn.com, Mark Papermaster, who is AMD's CTO, says, and I quote, we knew the 7M would be a big challenge for us, so we made the bet. We shifted our resources onto the new node. We didn't just dip our toes into the water, we went all in. And they have said that they're going to have an immense focus on 7NM. And I think we have the opportunity to be positioned to be much stronger than we originally anticipated. But I have to say that our original plan was to be positioned very strongly. So any delay from our competitor could simply strengthen the value from AMD that AMD could bring to the market. Uh, furthermore, uh, Mark Papermaster added that uh, 7NM processors will provide double the performance per watt of the energy expended compared to that of the previous node, and obviously that's significant. Obviously, with the various delays that Intel have suffered on the 10NM process, it has allowed AMD to play cash up. Of course, how the two companies are going to be competing in, let's say, one year's time remains a mystery. But for now, AMD are winning a lot of hearts, not just for gamers, of course, with the desktop series of processors like the Ryzen 5 1600X, and then, of course, updated to the 2600X. Both of those proved to be immensely popular with gamers. And even content creators, of course, uh, embraced the 1700 series of processors and now the 2700 series of processors. So AMD already have nailed that for gaming. But also, the Threadripper series of CPUs have been absolutely going down a storm. Everyone's loving those processors, and it's unquestionably a better value proposition now. Let's say the 2990WX is unquestionably a better value proposition than anything Intel has to offer. And now the company are looking to do the same, of course, with Epic, and 7NM Epic is going to be absolutely insane. The fact of the matter is, AMD's roadmap is very aggressive on the CPU side of things. And Vega has a lot of potential in the compute arena, not necessarily 
uh, something that perhaps is going to be great for us in gaming in the short term, but Navi is going to be a very interesting GPU also, and we're certainly going to be exploring that in the not too distant future. And now we have some tiering news and we're going to be starting things out with the level one and level two cache information for tiering. So as we all know, one of the things that NVIDIA were telling us is, of course, that Turing and Pascal are very different architectures. Turing has vastly improved things. And of course, we've gone into things such as the drastic improvements in shading performance with, according to NVIDIA, it's about 50% faster. You can check that out in a video. Uh, that we put out yesterday. We'll try to remember to link it in the video description of this video. And there's also a lot more information regarding benchmarks and all of this stuff as well. You can check out some of this stuff in article form as well. Once again, you can find that in the description of this video or the pinned comment down below. But now a new leak has emerged on the internet and this gives us insight into the cache situation of Turing. So in a nutshell, we have a drastically increased capacity for the cache. So level two cache has been improved by two times. So the capacity is double. So we have six megabytes compared to three megabytes with Pascal. Furthermore, the level one cache has also been increased as well. So it's 2.7 times larger compared to Pascal. We also see a lower latency cache as well, which is obviously instrumental in performance. What does all of this mean? Well, once again, I will be doing a full Turing architecture overview in the not too distant future, but the takeaway here is very simple. In theory, at least, it will reduce the need for optimization. It should make programming and development of uh, applications to really take advantage of the Turing architecture simpler. Plus, performance benefits of lower latency and higher amounts of cache just, well, speak for themselves. If you have an application which routinely takes data, larger cache simply means that there's a greater chance that data will be in faster memory cache after all. The purpose of it is to store data in very fast memory closer to the chip, so latency is better and access times are faster. So if you have more cache and, of course, faster cache, then evidently it does mean that applications can take advantage of that. And in theory anyway, certain applications should see a speedo. How much of a difference is it really going to make? Well, obviously we don't know all of the information yet. Apparently there is still an awful lot of details still being uh, kept back, which does make sense. But I do get the feeling that Turing is going to be a very impressive chip when it finally drops. We also have a couple of quotes from a developer by the name of Gaijin. They are working on a World War II MMO by the name of Enlisted. According to them, when they took to the stage recently at Gamescom, they have stated that they are incredibly impressed with the RTX Turing architecture. How impressed? Well, according to them, using the Vulkan API, which is always a good sign because obviously it means that the drivers are becoming optimized for Vulkan as well as DirectX 12, they are able to get their game running at 90 frames per second at 4K. Um, that's pretty bloody impressive. Obviously, we're going to have to wait for other benchmarks to see how this is going to compare to, let's say, the 1080 tie or the Vega 64 and so on. But even so, 90 frames per second at 4K on a fairly good looking game. I mean, no one can tell me this game looks ugly by any means. It's bloody impressive to me. Oh, and a small update concerning Ansel as well. NVIDIA are updating Ansel to support RTX technology. Now, obviously, Ansel is a really cool piece of NVIDIA tech. It allows you to take in-game screenshots at ludicrous resolutions and allows you to play around the camera and so on and so on. Unfortunately, not all games do support it, but games such as The Witcher do. And if you do uh, play around with Ansel, you can get some really mind-blowing shots. I have to say, I was actually screwing around recently with Final Fantasy XV, just screwing around just for the hell of it. And yeah, it's a lot of fun just to kind of take games and be your own uh, photographer. So what changes are they making? Well, according to a post from NVIDIA themselves, Ansel's RTX newest feature, Ansel Ray Tracing, allows the tech to create ray trace Ansel photos with the highest possible fidelity. Here's how it works. When you're in Ansel mode in a supported ray trace game, you can fly around using the free camera, the in-game engine, the user's in-game graphic settings. The moment you pause, 
Ansel RT quickly cranks, cranks up, excuse me, the, the level of ray tracing to beyond real time levels for the best possible in game photos. So, for example, you could see 10 times the amount of refractions per pixel, ambient occlusion by 12, and shadow samples by 32, and reflection samples by 40 times. And then it uses deep learning to upscale this even further. So in a nutshell, if you're playing a game like Shadow of the Tomb Raider or Metro Exodus, you will be able to play the game as normal with ray tracing enabled. But if you decide to enable Ansel mode, the level of detail just goes up through the roof, meaning that the game will look absolutely mind-boggling. As a slight aside, it also will give us a peek of how games of the future might look. I also wonder how this might be used for people who decide to make machinima. It could be really cool to actually use this for graphics and I suspect some people will really start pushing this to um, insane levels, particularly with Unreal Engine as well. And I don't just of course mean Ansel here, but for people who want to put the time in, who do want to use ray tracing, it's going to be really cool and I, I just can't wait to see what people are going to start putting out here and of course what screenshots are going to look like in the future. Anyway, that's a pretty short video for today because because, well, I have a lot of stuff to do. There's going to be a uh, review up today, plus a lot of other stuff. So unfortunately, it's just a little bit crazy. So I don't get to talk about all the stuff that I wanted to. But with all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.